everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to reflect a little bit more on Venus's opposition to Pluto. Now, Venus just made the opposition, so it is just now separating from the um, aspect to Pluto. Pluto in Capricorn, Venus in Cancer, um, but it's still a good time to take a look at it. Venus passing through the opposition to Pluto can be um, very instructive, it can learn a lot, it can be a little bit painful. In particular, I want to talk about um, the connection between Venus and Pluto and um, family. I think that among the many possible significations of Venus and Cancer opposite Pluto and Capricorn, um, family is one of the ones that I have seen the most throughout my career. Um, talking to clients, watching it pass through the opposition to Pluto every year since I've been an astrologer, because Pluto has been in Capricorn since I've been an astrologer. And it's true that often Venus will represent love or relationships or sexuality. And something about Venus opposing Pluto can suggest catharsis and change, transformation, healing, uh, death. Uh, the, the crucible of Venus opposite Pluto can certainly pertain to love, romance, and so forth. But oddly, Venus opposite Pluto time and time again points to the myth the mythology or the fantasy of family, uh, loss, death, processing, the, the changing of family constellations, all very Venus and Cancer opposite Pluto. So in order to look at that today, rather than do my normal thing, which is maybe to break down a theme, look at some of the insights or lessons around, I'm actually going to read you an essay today, one of my favorite, and just let you think on it. And maybe I'll offer a few reflections at the end. Uh, and tell you how I think this essay pertains to um, Venus and Cancer opposite Pluto. So that's the agenda. The, the, the essay is um, literally called Mythology as Family. It's by James Hillman, and it comes from his book, A Blue Fire, which are uh, basically these are selections of his writings that were um, uh, edited by Thomas More, who is uh, another famous author who wrote a book that I really love called Care of the Soul. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's zoop, bring it back. Um, so before we read that, and before we get into it, I'll show you on the real-time clock once more, but uh, I should start by reminding you to like and subscribe and share your comments. That helps the channel to grow, helps more people to find it. You can always find a transcript of my daily talks uh, on the website, nightlightastrology.com. Next week, we'll be demoing um, our new programs. So at long last, we will be, uh, uh, we'll be actually... Uh, promoting and the pre-registration sale for two new courses will begin. One is a 2023 planet and plant moon circle. Um, and the other one is a series of master classes I'll be teaching one per quarter, four classes each so 16 classes on the year on four different advanced topics in ancient astrology. So you can look for those next week. All right. Well, it is story hour but I'm forgetting myself here. Let's take a look at the real-time clock first. So just in case you need a reminder, here is, <clears throat> whoops, let's back this up. All right, here we go. Oops, here we go. Here is Tuesday, August 9th, and you can see that the opposition is just passing by. But it's still a very good time to be meditating on this, either in the wake of things that have already happened or in the things that may still be in the process of playing out a little bit as we're just one degrees off from the opposition. So, <clears throat> all right, I hope you guys enjoy this essay. No, no, remember, this is just, I'm just, this is where I'm coming from. I feel like I need to issue this qualifier before I read it, which is to say, I don't expect everyone to agree with every single thing that James Hillman thought or wrote or believed or, you know, uh, whatever, any more than I would expect anyone to agree with every single thing I say on my channel, right? You are free thinkers, and I respect your ability to process this however you like. I just find this to be a very provocative and interesting essay on mythology as family. So, and I think I'm going to, I'll tell you how I think it applies to Venus opposite Pluto at the end, but even just the essay, I feel like I could just read the essay itself and just like drop the mic and if you just set this essay next to Venus opposite Pluto, Venus and Cancer in particular, I think you'll get it. But okay, family. We are born into a family 
And at the last, we rejoin its full extension when gathered to the ancestors. Family grave, family altar, family trust, family secrets, family pride. Our names are family names. Our physiognomies bear family traits, and our dreams never let us depart from home. Father and brother, father and mother, brother and sister, from those faces and those rooms, even alone and only ourselves, we are also always part of them, partly them. Where does family fit in the modern myth of individual independence? That myth says home is what you leave behind. Moving on means moving out. You can't go home again unless after failure or divorce. Women want careers downtown where the action is. Men long for something more undefined, but surely not more family. Marriages and family founding, especially foundings of large families, are more and more countered by separations, living apart, single-parented households, divorces, generations divided, children in daycare, elders in Arizona. The place where one is most likely to be killed is at home, both perpetrator and victim family members. Yet family has been battered by more than these sociological developments it has taken an even worse beating from the notion of development itself nothing has abused the family more than our psychological theories of development with their myth of individual independence family so goes the developmental tale is only the beginning a necessary evil which like all beginnings must be left behind an adult has grown up declared his independence and his life and liberty are dedicated to the pursuit of his own happiness in the United States, a newborn infant is believed to be so symbiotically fused with its mother that every effort must be made to develop its ability to separate, to stand on its own as early as it can. In Japan, a newborn infant is believed to be so utterly alien that every effort must be made to enfold it within the human community as early as possible. Two opposite trajectories of development, either is right or wrong. Both are living myths. Myths because they are lived unconsciously as truths and have long-term consequences. Psychoanalysis has swallowed whole the myth of individual development away from family. Everyone who buys an hour of analysis buys into this myth called strengthening the ego. The first step of any current treatment in mental hygiene, brainwashing, question mark. Uncover the family romance, as it is called, which in the widest sense refers to the damaging fantasies arising from an individual's relations within the family. Notice here the focus on the independent ego. The family represents merely the limits imposed by genetic nature or environmental nurture, a restrictive influence on personal growth. Other cultures would not imagine the individual over and against family. Where other cultural myths dominate, an individual is always perceived as a family member. Our myth, however, insists that ego is strengthened and full personality achieved away from familial ties and pressures. Psychology has even invented secondary embellishments to make its myth of individual independence more compelling. Otherwise, a person might naively suppose that the family pulls and pressures are what other cultures regard as filial bonds, kinship, love, family pride, parental sacrifice. Therefore, psychology has discovered an entire demonology within family. The irremediable envy of sibling rivalry between brothers and sisters, castration threats by fathers, disguised cannibalism by sons, devouring mothers and schizogenic, schizo schizogenetic mothers, as well as omnipotent, amoral, polyamorously perverse children, polymorphously perverse children. These are only some of the denizens of the deeps in family life. Of course, therefore, maturing, coping, and handling have come to mean freedom from family. And of course, psychology finds itself justified to go right into the home to exercise by means of family therapy the creatures that its own myth has created. Is it too much to assert that the most devastating effect of Western psychology is neither the reductive sexualization of the mind nor the pseudo-religion of self-centeredness, but rather its deliberate rupture of the great chain of generations, which it has accomplished by means of its myth of individual development toward independence? Not honor your father and mother, but blame them and you'll come out strong. The overwrought, exhausting difficulties that consume, fa consume family life indicate that something important is going on. Any big emotion signals value. The task is to discover the gold in the sludge. Let's see what we can recover from four typically emotional moments in family life. False identity. During childhood, traits of personality are identified and one's identif identity begins to form partly in accordance with the perceptions of others. Gilly's a real tomboy, a string bean who only has time for animals. Will Gilly ever marry? Will she become a lesbian or a vegetarian? Billy can't keep out of trouble. I can't trust him out of my sight. Will Billy ever hold down a decent job? Might he end up in prison? 
Millie was the quietest baby, always smiling and such a charmer. Will Millie stay home with her parents, keeping them happy or get pregnant at 15? From these sorts, from these sorts of family fantasies, two contradictory cliches emerges. No one knows you better than your family, and my family can't see me at all. The division of goods between Gilly, Billy, and Millie keeps them in family-determined roles that seem as time goes on to be false identities. Was I really a tomboy, or was I only living out what my mother wanted to be herself? Am I really a charmer, or was I only placating my father? Discovering whether these perceptions are true or false, that illusion of finding a real identity independent of the family fantasy, is far less rewarding than is the recognition that within the family, a personal myth begins to take shape. The myth that forms one's identity. By identity here, I mean identifiable reactions, habits, styles. One finds oneself inside a myth, which is neither true nor false, but simply the precondition for fitting one into the family drama as a recognizable character. Moreover, if there are no pronounced family fantasies, the drama doesn't work, and we flounder about in that strangely loveless limbo that psychology calls an identity crisis. Family love expresses itself by means of these fantasies of what I want you to become and what I am proud of you for. These fantasies of identity show that someone is noticing traits, habits, styles. Whether a person lives into the myth or rebels against it, there must first be a myth. Relatives and in-laws. Most lives are spent among likes, similar budgets, similar age spreads and gaps, similar tastes and vocabularies. The people whom we choose to be with do not truly force us beyond our usual psychological boundaries. In the family, however, just where you might expect to be with those most like you, you encounter instead a collection of the strangest folk. At any large family gathering, there come together the most extraordinary behaviors and most incompatible opinions, yet all this is in the same clan. Voltaire supposedly said, nothing human is alien to me. Relatives and in-laws provide the opportunity of extending our human understanding to what strikes us as alien indeed. Where else, how else, would one ever spend an evening with a man from Orange County who pays dues to the Klan, or with a math professor who interprets signals from outer space, or a junkyard dealer who did time in the state penitentiary, and the manners, the clothes, the bodies? This is more than alien, Voltaire. This is downright outlandish, freakish. Here we realize that large family affairs, rather than being scenes of convention, are actually performances of high comedy, outrageously funny, which also serve to encourage one's own peculiarities. After all, as an in-law and relative yourself, you too appear and are rather freakish to the others. The attentiveness you pay to the in-laws and relatives at such reunions works both ways, for rarely are you yourself heard out so patiently with such curiosity. Family seems to evoke a profound curiosity in each of its members about the others, especially the more distantly related or more peculiarly, peculiarly entwined. Gossip abounds. People spill the beans and try to catch up on what has happened, quote, since we last met. A catching up that goes beyond recording births and deaths. Shadows come rushing out of the closet and join the party without moral opprobrium. A large family reception receives in magnificentia et gloria, all shadows, all events, whether good news or bad, associated with family members, are magnified and glorified, thereby extending the size of the family's heart. The measure of a family's magnanimity is not what it gives to charity, but rather its capacity to shelter the shadows of its members. Charity begins at home. We each feel this heart extending when, for instance, a little pride arises over the naming as, quote, best insurance salesman in the county, a seemingly unremarkable young person who is nonetheless married to your great niece. Family meals. The sign home cooking might still bring in some customers, but for many, the family table was the place of trauma. Studies in family disorders accuse the evening meal of being the major focus of household tension. Here, at table, family fights over money, politics, or morals are most likely to break out in later eating patterns, the rhythms of chewing, swallowing, breathing and talking, the intermissions between silence and noise, the very notion of what constitutes good food take on their definitive forms. Here, too, gross food disorders, like anorexia or bulimia, often appear first. When the atmosphere at meals be whether the atmosphere at meals be boisterous and competitive or chaotic with phoning and television or gravely formalized, tension is always on the menu. Tension at the start of a meal belongs with the instinct of appetite. Just go to the zoo at feeding time and watch the animals pace and snarl, or ask a good Italian waiter about getting the prima first course on the table quickly. 
<clears throat> Meals are meant to start fast and conclude in digestive leisure. Tension, therefore, belongs to the moment of sitting down at the table, and not only for animal reasons. Tension arises as unconscious recognition of the sacramental nature of this family act. Grace overtly acknowledges the sacramental tension, and so do all the many rituals that go with family meals, fixed places and dinner on time, the ritual of clean hands, of setting places or clearing the table, and the endless attempts to mollify the tension with light music, dimmer lights, and rules concerning what is appropriate to talk about at table. All this elaborate etiquette in every family will have some rituals, even if utterly disguised as just dig in. Attempts to propitiate the archetypal forces that gather invisibly around the family meals are ready to explode civilized conventions at the most innocuous provocation. Going back home. Whether from prison camp after war or just taking the bus home for Thanksgiving, homecoming is fraught with dreadful anticipation. Opening the front door releases overwhelming emotions and also the counterforce of repression against those emotions that so often characterizes the stifled atmosphere of returning. Here we must remember that going home is always going back home. Returning is essentially a regressive act in keeping with an essential function of family to provide shelter for the regressive needs of the soul. Everyone needs a place to crawl and lick his wounds, a place to hide and be 12 years old, inept and needy. The bar, the bed, the boardroom, and the buddies do not meet the gamut of needs which always limp along behind the myth of independent individuality. Something always remains undeveloped and this piece needs to go back home as country and Western lyrics often enough affirm. Going back may mean sleeping till two in the afternoon or taking refuge in the bathroom, crying with mom in the kitchen, or just complaining as do the grandparents who fall ill during every visit. Going home at whatever age offers going back regression and the fight against family during these return trips is therefore a displacement of the fight against regression. We don't want to admit the weakness in our characters and the hungers in our desires. We don't want to admit that we have not grown up. And so blame the family both for bringing out the worst and then for not indulging it enough. Meanwhile, that strange sense of consciousness ebbing away, going down the family drain. The debilitating energy loss strikes everyone alike as if a communal power outage, everyone caught in repeating and resisting old patterns. Nothing has changed after all these years. No one can get out for even a walk to break the smell. spell. The whole family sinking deeper into the upholstery and television has little to do with it. It may even be in such moments the household God who saves. These moments attested the capacity of family for sharing. French anthropology used to speak of a participation mystique in a common soul or psychic state and for containing the regressive needs of the soul. No one is at fault, no one is kicked out, and no one can be helped. In the paralysis lies the profoundest source of acceptance. Grandpa can go on grumbling, brother attacking the administration, sister introvertedly attending her exacerbating eczema, and mother going on covering up with solicitous busyness. Everyone goes down the drain because family love allows family pathology. An immense tolerance for the hopeless shadow in each. The shadow that we each carry is a permanent part of our baggage and then we unpack when we go home. These four bad moments are symptomatic of what lies at the root of family problems, not the failure to relate, not the breakdown of the old patriarchal model, not even the incurably freakish, especially depressive pathologies that make their home at home, but rather the root lies in the archetypal nature of family itself. As an archetypal reality, the experience of family feels so often unreal because family is permeated through and through with external exaggerations an impossible too muchness or mythic dimension, which is the stuff of the symptoms we suffer and also the stuff of much of Western culture's stories, novels, and dramas. And this mythical exaggeration is at work even in the most conventionalized, urban, eat and run, unconnected, first name parents, upward mobile, a religious unit of consumers called family. Family is less a rational place than a mythic one. And the expectation of finding R rational reality at home is precisely what makes us condemn it as unreal. Attempts at unambiguous communication, reasonable discussion of problems, and structuring a new paradigm all overlook the fundamentals at the source of family life. The deep-seated and indestructible complexes of the psyche, once called daimons, ghosts, and ancestors, whose place is the home. The notorious nuclear family of statistics, sermons, and advertisements, two parents, two siblings, a family car, and a pet, does not correspond with the Latin word from which family derives. This famous word 
is inseparable from the idea of land settlement and is therefore essentially the house itself with the persons living in it. And thus, the religion of the familia will be a religion of practical utility, of daily work, of struggle with perils. It is not the worship of an idea of kinship. Familia, familias to the Romans meant primarily a house and all belonging to it, a household establishment, family, servants, domestics, not family, wife, and children only. Neither parentage nor descent, nor not even blood kinship within the clan for which the Romans had the word gens, determined the use of the word family, place did. By Romans here, I mean the entire civilized Western world and its language that lives on in our Latinate roots. Because familia connoted a physical house and all belonging to it as goods, fortune, inheritance, the more accurate part of the fantasy of the American nuclear family may be the estate car and the household pet. In fact, the domesticated animal was considered often a familiar. Living together in familiarity as a psychoeconomic organism, such as the meaning of family. Even the Greco word oikonomia, from which it comes economy and economics, means household management or keeping house. The family is a function of the house rather than vice versa, where house is the concrete container of multiple familiarities and intimacies. The domesticated from domus, house, world of belongings. What belongs to us and to what we belong, and where belongings also mean what is fitting, appropriate, and customary. This etymological revelation suggests a far broader sense of family, giving primary emphasis to the idea of a supportive psychic system under the same roof, whether farm, kibbutz, or a condominium block. This broader sense includes the notion of service and participation, a membership investing in and benefiting from a larger household. Filial piety and brotherly love seem irrelevant to this household, yet it does include all the things belonging to an estate, animals, goods, and furnishings. Your family is your furniture in more than a metaphoric sense. Little wonder that such bitterness can erupt over dividing the family dishes after divorce or death, or that dreams of the old family car can continue to haunt long after the car itself was trashed. Various gods and goddesses lived with the ancient family. Vesta at the hearth, focus is the Latin word who must be acknowledged first and daily, else the central bonding flame might go out, Janus at the gate so that one remembered the different faces required for inside and outside, the three different gods of the doorway of the door, the hinges and the threshold, who prevented bad spirits from entering the domestic interior, the lar or lares, who were the ever-present and remembered ghosts of the household's dead, food fallen to the floor at a meal was once taboo, belonging now to these familiars of the underworld. And there were the penate, pen, pen, penates, or the wee ones of the cupboards, without whom old Mother Hubbard might find not even a bone. The ancient home gave plenty of place to the invisibles that live in a family, propitiating and domesticating its daimons, which it acknowledged as rightfully belonging. Above all, there was Juno, Hera in Greece, who presided like a stately, powerful Roman matron over the psychic and material well-being of the household. In Juno was combined instinct and institution, marriage both as that coupling urge for permanent bonding as, and as a societal stability. The regular order of life within the household and within the bodies of the women in the household was regulated by the calendar. The first day of each month, the calends was dedicated to Juno. Little houses made of clay were devotional objects in her cult, and heroes of myth, the most great Greek heroes, were sent on their way because of Hera were recognized as such not only by their deeds, but also by the trophies they brought back home. Ulysses felt himself a failure because after a 20-year absence, he arrived home unclothed and without spoils. His family, by the way, included his old nurse and his old dog. Again, that emphasis upon ties beyond blood and upon animals and things. The idea of family service, however, extends beyond the maintenance of its property, the heirlooms and records, keeping anniversaries and celebrations, beyond the daily labor devoted to the well-being of the household, those chores that belong to homemakers. One also serves an invisible family as if an archetypal force. With the passing of time, a sense of its own power grows within one's psyche like the movements of its skeleton inside one's flesh, which keeps one in servitude to patterns entombed in our closest attitudes and habits. From this interior family, we are never free. This service keeps us bonded to the ancestors. How we are able to live these habits and attitudes and inherited propensities to specific diseases, our own morbidity provides each person with an individual way of honoring, quote, our fathers and our mothers. I've been attempting to present family as a supreme metaphor for our life on earth because it presents that force of human attachment to a dwelling place, of domestication, 
and the no of the domestication of the savage or nomad of honoring the invisible the demonic and the dead of making intimate and familiar and owned the persons animals and things of this world taking them home to the hearth ourselves as long-term caretakers in bondage to our fate on earth playing out the comedy of human continuity <clears throat> Wow, I love that. I just that essay to me is is so um, thought provoking, so interesting. It is not the typical write up on family. Um, what I love about it is the way that he, time and time again, says, you know, we have a paradigm, and you know, I honor this paradigm at work in my own life as as a real one, and in the lives of my clients and students, my own family members, that there is something about you know, individuating away from the family, right? And healing family wounds or family traumas. A lot of people listening to this probably have broken families and can't relate to aspects of the essay because family may not even be a part of your life anymore. But what I love that he said is that even if your story has been one of separating and individuating from whatever limits or constraints a family or parents or the environment tried to put on you, it is exactly that situation that is somehow the, the, the grit against which we grind in order to work out our own mythology. And so family is this inevitable part of the psyche that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really important to honor. When we say honor the ancestors, in a sense, what we can mean, even if we don't have ancestors that we feel are honorable, you know what I mean? Is that it, it, whoever we've becoming that we feel is virtuous or, or good in, in contrast to where we've come, uh, could, we, we couldn't have become that without the sludge of whatever that family darkness was. Um, and so, you know, we're, we grow out of manure sometimes. And I think that's part of what he's saying, which is very Venus and Cancer opposite Pluto. It, it can be painful. There can be things that are terrible and awful and horrible and worth separating from and individuating from in a family. And yet, if we look at family as an archetypal reality, not just the literal trauma that I had to like evolve from or something like that, but and in, in we, we can then see family as something beyond the moral good or bad that has been a part of our story. And we can see it as an archetypal function of the psyche that houses uh, aspects, shadow aspects of ourselves that have been absolutely vital to who we've become. So I love that part of the essay. But more than that, what I love is that he says, family uh, as an arc, not just the literal family. I mean, what he's doing is throughout the whole essay is just using all of the images and metaphors of family that are familiar to lots of us, right? And he's talking about that as a, as a psychic reality that we always go back to. And when you go back to it, there's a sense of being sucked into things that, oh, I thought I was past that, or I thought I was beyond that, or it feels regressive. He says family is like the a, a place for re the regressive aspect of our own psyche. And he's saying that the regressive aspect of our own psyche is not good or bad. It just is. Something about family and roots and history and ancestry and the past, it, there's a regressive pull in all of that. And it, it it's, but it's, it's an as an archetypal force it is always a part of we we have to keep going back just like the Tao says that um every going out is followed by a return and that return by nature is regressive and so this is why i remember i remember specifically in an ayahuasca ceremony i felt like i was cleansing the karmic past from my family you know and then it just felt like there was more and more and more and more and I remember during one ceremony, I, I finally had this realization that this is an archetypal activity. The, the, the exploration of, of uh, the past and family trauma and so forth. And there's no getting to the bottom of it because it's more like family is the psychic reality. It's always there. It's changing and morphing. But any time that there is some need to move forward and let go of the past, something like the family psychically appears and we get pulled into it like a vortex and we get pulled into it and we may think, oh, well, then I've, you know, I've gone back in order to like overcome. Uh, but it's actually, 
it's also the family itself is also a place that can that can hold and give space to what is always an archetypally regressive about life that there is something about life itself that we can call regressive um or that we can call um you know that that we can place in some a word like return or going back home something like that and it, going back home is sometimes it has the feeling like a homecoming or going home from the holidays and it feels joyful if you go home for the holidays for more than a couple of days pretty soon you realize you know Ram Das was right when he said, if you think you're enlightened, spend a week with your family. What I, I just, I, I love the essay so much because it's, it's sort of like saying, don't try to get rid of the past, the complex shadows, the history that uh, is regressive, because um, the more that you try to block it out or redeem it once and for all, or get to the bottom of it, uh, the more deeply you get sucked or pulled in by it. Uh, what you resist persists and there's so that's why i think that's why there's there's this sense of going back to things not just our family but anything that we sort of need to go back to or need to return to something and in returning we often find something we missed or we longed for and then we realize well that was nice but i have to set it down again and keep moving or we return to it and realize oh this was toxic why did i come back here and then we go on and we keep moving. But that that's a psychic, eternal reality in return and home and family. Um, and when I think of Venus and Cancer opposite Pluto, I don't just think, I mean, there's one level at which you can think about Venus opposite Pluto as the <clears throat> transformation of family karma or dealing with some heavy elements around things like love, beauty, family, marriage, etc. cetera. Um, but I think it's also important to just step back and acknowledge that the Venus-Pluto dynamic speaks to the need in the psyche for regression. Um, because regression is, it, it can be a very, again, it can be a very positive thing. It can be a very, very uh, difficult thing. Anyway, those are just a few extra thoughts that I have about that essay, <clears throat> which I really love. I think it's very interesting. What did you guys think of it? What do you like about it? I'd love to hear your reflections. Um, and hopefully that gives you some good things to think about in the wake of Venus opposing Pluto. I think there was there's a lot there to, to chew on. If you liked it, I highly recommend the book that it comes from, which is called A Blue Fire uh, by James Hillman. It's a series of essays that he has on a lot of different topics. And that is just one essay. I mean, he's got um, family, father, <coughs> excuse me, father, fathers and daughters, fathers and sons, mothers, mothers and sons. The Child, etc. Lots of different essays on family, uh, among other things, too. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this today. Good food for thought. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Share your comments and uh, your own reflections. What did, what really struck a bell or what stood out to you? What, what was uh, thought-provoking about this essay? I'd love to hear from you guys. And don't forget, you can get a transcript of my daily talks on the website, nightlightastrology.com. And uh, that's what I've got for today. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye, everyone.